Okay, uh, again, thank you, and uh, it's hard to follow my fellow panelists, their presentations were great. Um, but I want to start with what we started our, uh, our panel with, when, and that was uh, defining, uh, using a definition that we've been given to play with, and I wanted to then go into some examples of what we've done at Patients Like Me. So the definition that we're working from is citizen science is an approach to research that involves public directly in the research project process itself as partners and collaborators. So I want you to think about that because I'm going to flip that around a little bit as we go along. So the 300,000 members of patients like me, representing over 2,300 different conditions, actually engage in research activities in, ra in various and different ways on the site. And that actually influences the relationship that develops and evolves over time. Um, upon joining the site, members become participants in a robust web-based uh, research community as part of a patient-powered research network. So the ethical and legal implications of this relationship are actually governed by our company's documents that actually uh, have an explicit user agreement about how we use the data, how we actually make money, uh, and the value of the data that we're trying to be able to create in terms of being able to have the environment uh, sustain a longitudinal way of gathering data that can be ro richly and robustly used over time. Um, so this is... Um, and also embedded in our, our documentation for the company is an openness and a transparency policy. We're very clear about that as people come into that re, uh, relationship with us. So it's a different approach to research than most of you are accustomed to. It's really more about openness and sharing rather than privacy and protection and trying to learn from what we can from uh, opening up those doors a bit. So the social implication of participating in uh, patients like me is actually largely governed by the communities themselves, um, where the social norms actually evolve and mature as the members of the community start to engage in and relate with each other. And that's something that actually is a very organic process, and as a community begins to grow and build, that, uh, those social norms begin to evolve and change, and they become more sophisticated and understand more about the kinds of questions that actually do matter amongst the others in the community. So our contract with patients is to use the data um, they contribute to help them answer questions that matter to them, but also that can actually be applied to a broader population. And that question is, given my status, you know, how am I doing, um, what's the best outcome I can hope to achieve, and how am I going to get there, and who do I need to collaborate with in order to get there? Um, so let's look at three ways that we actually build relationships with patients on the site in, th in ways that we actually uh, conduct different types of research um, that we do. So there's uh, research that's initiated by our own team. Uh, so we have research scientists and data scientists and engineers and software developers and a, and a load of different people who are part of our team that actually are looking at the data all the time and trying to see if we see trends around engagement or trends around other things that are coming up that we actually start to ask specific questions about. So uh, over seven years, we've actually been collecting data on five common symptoms of illness from all of our members. Um, they, they include pain, fatigue, insomnia, anxiety, and depression. So last year, we decided to look specifically at insomnia. What's happening across all these conditions with people who are complaining about sleep problems or are measuring that over time? And the results actually were compared to the results from a generalized uh, national um, poll that was done with the National Sleep Foundation. And what we found was that a significant uh, increase in the amount of impact of insomnia and sleep problems in people with chronic illness that just far outweighs that which is seen in the general population. So what do we do with that? Well, we can identify that and we can talk about that, but we can also begin to segment that by population in, in separate communities and conditions and better understand what the impact of um, sleep problems might be on people with fibromyalgia which there's some belief that it has some underlying sleep disorder um, as part of that, that constellation of the disease itself. How does that compare with people with ALS? How does that compare with people with multiple sclerosis or people with diabetes and that sort of thing? So we're really just now digging in deeper into that, and we have the metadata behind all of those um, kinds of reports from patients to better understand the conditions they're living with and the comorbidities that might be impacting it as well. So our relationship with the patient is already established in that, in that situation. Um, we've actually sent out an invite where we clearly state why we're going to be looking at the historical data and as well now a prospective survey that's going to go out and ask them more specific things that we can then use to compare to the National Foundation, Sleep Foundation study. So our commitment, again, is to ensure that we maximize the data. People are taking time to contribute this information, and we want to be able to repurpose it ultimately that uh, we can provide valuable insights, not only to the individuals, but to the others like them on, in the community and outside the community, and then to people like yourselves who are in discovery and development and delivery, and how can we bring that in? 
Then we have external uh, investigator research that um, gets initiated by people who come to us from the academic and clinical environments, from pharmaceutical companies, from government, and say, listen, we have these questions we'd like to get a sense of from people within your community. So that requires our team to actually engage more sp uh, specifically with the community in ways where we say, listen, we're going to be explicit with you about the kinds of questions they're asking, why they're asking them. You can contribute your ideas about whether they're questions that matter to you. Um, and we'll give that data back into the, uh, into the researcher so that they can appreciate that and understand. And I think we heard that before. Sometimes the researchers push back and say, wait a minute, I have a protocol already designed and, and defined. I want to do it my way. And we'll say, you know what? No, you, that's not the way we do things here. We engage people and we build the relationship with you in order to be able to be explicit about it. And then finally, I want to talk to you a little bit about the patient-initiated research on patients like me. Um, that's a different relationship. In this case, the definition of citizen science is actually flipped. Now the research involves engaging the researchers directly in the process itself as partners and collaborators with the patients. So the example I want to use is our clinical trial that was conducted in Italy in 2008 with a small group of patients with ALS that reported that lithium carbonate was slowing the progression of ALS. Now, you can imagine patients on our site who have ALS, and we have one of the largest communities of ALS in the, in the world, um, were excited by this potential and sought out ways and methods of being able to get access to lithium to be able to start testing this themselves and learn whether or not this was going to have an impact for them in their progression. So um, over time, we already had some of those patients on the site, but in fact, there was a lot of patients with uh, ALS who were not members of the site who were actually communicating amongst each other around the world, around the at just this one abstract that came out of an Italian study that was actually translated in Google Translate by individual citizens to figure out what were the methods they use and how could we replicate that and how can we put that into a Google spreadsheet that the rest of the people in the, around the, the world could start to work with it. So when we understood what was happening and some of the buzz in the forum was starting to talk about it, uh, we thought, wow, something seems to be happening here. And it was at the same time that the patients themselves came to us and said, can you help us? Can you help us start to put, build within the site a way to longitudinally track how people are doing on lithium carbonate as well as uh, measure our lithium, you know, provide a space for us to put in our lithium levels that we're getting from our docs and other pieces of information that would be important. We did this. We actually were able to show within six months that we refuted the findings of the clinical trial and actually did this uh, long before the first funded trial started even recruiting, which ultimately found the same results that we found. So not to replicate or, or to, um, you know, take over the, the gold standard, but to find a way to complement it in a way that citizens can actually contribute to. So I know I'm at the end. I'm just going to finish with a couple of last minute statements. So patient-initiated research raises lots of important questions and uncertainty, yet the genie's out of the bottle. Um, it's here to stay and, we, and it will continue to push the boundaries of traditional research. So if you were to take the lithium study as just one example, one of the main people proposing this patient-led study was a patient with ALS living in Brazil. He used Google Translate to communicate with English-speaking people around the world. Which IRB, which ethics committee is responsible for that? Lithium carbonate is a generic drug. It's made by dozens of pharmaceutical companies around the world. It costs pennies. Which manufacturer should be held accountable if there's some adverse events that come as a result of that? Was the responsibility for each individual patient down to the doctor who wrote the script for that person to get the lithium itself? Does the responsibility lie with patients like me as a place where the data was collected and then published in research? And then finally, what is the responsibility of the patients themselves? So I ask you to start thinking about flipping this and moving from bedside to bench. We do democratize and we do bottom-up disruption. We do open sharing and transparency and ultimately we empower people to be more engaged and involved in finding the answers with us and complement the traditional avenues of research. So thank you very much.